We have to be out of here at 10.30. It's 9.30, so maybe we'll have questions until <clears throat> someone crazy grabs the microphone. And <laughs> or maybe we'll have questions for half an hour, something like that. And so if anybody has any questions, then there's a microphone there, and there's a microphone there. And uh, I'll try to answer them to the best that I can, best of my ability. So let's, sure, let's start. Uh, okay, so you talked about the idea of um, when you're confronting something that you fear, you like, you face it head on and you, you destroy it. But then you said uh, that the idea is when you're confronting something, you make the world out of it. And I was wondering if you could just, I mean, generally make, expound on make, what that means. You make your marriage out of the arguments. Okay. You know, you have arguments with your wife, you have arguments with your children. That's that chaotic state because no one's been able to formulate a habitable order from that, that domain of controversy and confusion. And then through dialogue, you erect a structure that's a house that you can both live in. And so that's the, that's the idea of making the world out of that chaos. And, and it's, a, it's frightening because, you know, if you really have, and this is why people often avoid having disputes with people they love, because it's frightening, right? You find out what the person's like and you find out what you're like. It's like, God, who wants to do that? Nobody. And so, you know, your heart rate goes up and it's, it, it's confrontation and conflict. And, and, and that's because you're encountering that domain that hasn't been properly mapped or configured. And so, and you're doing that with your predator detection systems, essentially. And so that chaos that, that threatens the stability, say, of the marriage is equivalent to, well, it's equivalent to the serpent in the tree. That's one form of equivalence. And, and then by dialogue, through dialogue and negotiation, you, you formulate the problem. What exactly is going on here? Where exactly are we? What exactly is the problem? And so you keep talking until you reach a consensus about that, one that you can live with, one that you can act out, right? And then, you, then maybe you come up with a solution to the problem and you've established peace again. And peace, that's the house that you can both live in. And that's the chaos. That's the chaos that people can fall into all the time and, and often do. And it's the chaos that makes a marriage wash up on the shores and, and transform into like, you know, 15 year divorce court. Very horrible thing. So that's the idea. Uh, okay, thank you. Okay. Hi, Dr. Peterson. Thank you so much for the talk and thanks for your teachings. It's really helped me a lot. I had a experience in grad school, two English degrees, and the way you described the humanities in my experience um, helped me understand my experience back then. So thank you. So the way That's you too bad. That's too bad that that <laughs> happens to be the case. Really, like that, you know, it's, it's really not good. But You don't have to tell me that. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, you know, I survived and I learned yeah. a lot. And, you know, I'm not, you know, ungrateful for my experience. I've, I've learned a lot. Um, but you said something, you described the Bible, the collection of stories in the Bible in an interesting way. And I wonder if it was on purpose. Uh, you described it as um, created by uh, an assembly of stories created by many people over time uh, that's hyperlinked into itself. And it sounds a lot like how uh, a description of like the internet and like how that works. Yeah, well, it's not, it's not accidental. I mean, because the internet's also a collective, it's a collective endeavor. God only knows what personality it's going to manifest, you know, but it's going to manifest some personality because it's learning to understand us very, very rapidly. So I think you could, there's no reason not to think about it as a precursor. I mean, the distance between the Bible and the internet is a lot less than the distance between a chimpanzee and a human being. So, you know, it's a, and the difference between a book and the internet is, it's also, it's, it's in some sense, it's a matter of, matter of degree rather than kind. So, I, I can't speculate, you know, because God only knows what's going to happen in the next 20 years. I certainly don't. And so, I don't know what the preconditions are for consciousness. I have no idea. And I don't think anybody knows. So, I guess we're going to find out. So, yep. Yep. Hey, Dr. Peterson. I'm curious about the connection between aesthetic beauty and religious experience. I think you've hinted at it once or twice over the course of this lecture. Um, is it possible um, for something that's incredibly beautiful to um, evoke a relig religious or mystical experience or something kind of in the same ballpark? I think that? that's what they're for. 
yeah, in some actually, sense. You know, I mean, if you look at the yeah. structure of like a, like a Renaissance cathedral, you know, that's there's just literally what I was just gonna. That was right, right. That was the, my uh, my tag on. To, I apologize, I mean to interrupt. My tag on to that question. The next part was. Um, um, is that why we have cathedrals built like as spectacular buildings uh, as opposed to yeah, like, well, a little box a, or something? Right. Well, it's a, if you're going to house the ultimate ideal, you build something beautiful, right, to, to represent its dwelling place. And it should be beautiful. And this is something that people do not take seriously. And this is especially something we don't take seriously in Canada. I mean, one of the, you, think about, you think about all the hundreds of millions of dollars that were invested into beauty in, in Europe. I mean, spectacular, excessive um, investment in beauty that's paid back. God only knows how many multiples of times. People make pilgrimages to Europe constantly because it's so beautiful that it just it staggers you. Beauty is so valuable and, and we're so afraid of it. And I think we're afraid of it because it does, it's a pathway. It's not the only pathway to the divine. I mean, there's, lot, there's pathways to the divine. Love is one of them, I suppose. But beauty, especially for people who have an affinity for beauty, it's, it's like music. It's one of those things that you can't argue against, right? You, you can't even understand. It just hits you. And, and it does, it shows you, well, it shows you the ideal. That's one way of thinking about it. But it also shows you, I think, it's like a vision of the potential future. It's something like that as well, that if we just got our act together and, and beautified things, that that's the place that we can inhabit and that would ennoble us and... That's why this Jerusalem, the heavenly city, is paved with gemstones. You know, they're crystalline, they emit light. and Yeah, it's the proper dwelling place for an enlightened consciousness. Beauty is the proper dwelling place for an enlightened consciousness. And we, we ignore it at our, at our spiritual and economic peril. It's like it's obvious that beauty, there's almost nothing more valuable than beauty. Economically, practically, right? So, yeah. Why that is, I mean, I, I don't... It's very, who knows? You know, I mean, why we, we experience gemstones, for example, is beautiful. It's very mysterious, but there are deep reasons for it. So. Hi. I have a bit of a similar question, actually. Um, I know what, <clears throat> at one of the ways in which um, the Bible is appreciated, even by uh, some of its uh, harshest critics and deeply atheistic people, is as a work of literature and is something... Um, at least um, the King James or the authorized translation of the Bible is something very aesthetically beautiful and a, and a great work of literature and a great work of poetry. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, just from your study of it and, and from your personal perspective, if there's any, any particular passages or, or parts of it that you find particularly uh, have struck you in that way or that you, that you cherish more than, more than any others that you'd be able to share? Or well, the ones, that have really op the ones that have really opened up to me, I think, are the stories in Genesis right up to the Tower of Babel, because I think, well, and hopefully I'll be able to talk to all of you about that, but I think I've got some sense of what they mean and why. I mean, I know it's not exhaustive, and obviously, but, like, and then the story in Exodus as well, I, I also feel that, like, I've got a handle on that, and so those have, those have hit me really, really hard. And, and that, you know, I mean, just trying to understand this first part of Genesis, to try to understand what these concepts mean has been, especially when I started to understand that the co concept that human beings are made in God's image, and that God is, has all those attributes that we just described, that human beings are made in God's image, that that's actually the cornerstone of our legal system. That really, that really rattled me because I didn't understand that clearly, that our body of laws has that metaphysical presupposition without which the laws fall apart. And that's starting to happen. It really is, you know, like the postmodern critique of law. The law schools are... I would say they're overrun by postmodernists who are undermining the structure of Western law as fast as they possibly can because they don't buy any of this. And so they're much more likely to just think of the law as something like a, like a casual, pragmatic tool to be manipulated for the purposes of bringing forth the utopia. It's a really, really, really bad idea. So it's very strange to me that we go off track when that metaphysical foundation starts to get rattled, and so. So, do you think your your appreciation of the aesthetic beauty of it comes from a belief in like the, the truth of its the underlying propositions? I mean, that's it's because like the, even the atheistic critics I'm thinking of, like like even Dawkins or yeah. Hitchens, really appreciate the Bible as just a piece of um, really beautiful literature, and, and I guess the quality of the writing and, and the 
sort of exalted themes behind it, even if they totally reject the underlying premises of it. But you seem to yeah. Well, say I don't. Th I don't think that you can see it as beautiful and poetic, with the, and reject the underlying premises because if you see it as beautiful and poetic, you're accepting the underlying premises with your experience of the beauty and the poetics, even though you may be, may be fighting it with your articulated rationality. So I think all that indicates is a disintegrated perspective on the book. And I'm not, it's not surprising that that's the case. I mean, it, it, it's the perspective that everyone has on the book, except with them it's more well-developed and well thought through. But I think it's fundamentally, they're not approaching the thing with enough respect. That's my sense. Is that, and who knows, right? Because I don't, I don't know. But what I've tried to do is to think, there's probably more to this than I know. And then try to understand it from that perspective, rather than to think, for example, well, it's a collection of, of superstitions that we've somehow outgrown. It's like, no, it's just, sorry, that's, that's not a deep enough analysis. Because it's got some truth, but it doesn't take into account the fact that the propositions still stand at the foundation of our culture. It doesn't address Nietzsche's central concern, which is that if you blow out the notion of God, the entire structure crumbles. You know, and you can debate that, fine. But I'd, you know, just assume that you debated it with Nietzsche, because he's a pretty tough customer to tangle with. So, and I don't think the, the atheist types, insofar as there's a type, I don't think they've wrestled with the real problems. So, yeah. So I appreciate you set out some ground rules, um, keep things rational, and uh, I think that's going to help us. What I'm wondering is, uh, so for instance, you had said elsewhere, the New Testament, from the best, from what you can see, it's psychologically correct, uh, and that's, you know, quite astounding, I would say. There's a lot of truth, and in, in the, your depictions of these stories elsewhere, you've pointed out, like, deep truths, you know, the, real powerful. So... What my question would be is, if we can say Nietzsche took a like an order of magnitude of uh, you know intelligence and you know depth to be able to predict what would happen in the next century, you know rationally, if the Bible's not the inherent word of God, what's going on? That's a good question. That, that's a really good question. I mean, I'm going to try to answer that rationally. But, uh, but uh, and as we move forward, but as I said, I don't want to leave people with the notion, because, you know, so in some ways, this is something I've thought about, what I've been thinking about for a long time, is I can't tell if I'm a, uh, like an advocate of the religious viewpoint or its worst possible critic, because I am doing my best to make it rational, and there's, an, there's a reductionistic element to that, but I think that I'm doing that while also leaving the door open to things that I don't understand, because I know that there's... There's more to this story than I understand or can understand. And I'm laying out what I can understand and I'm making it rational. But I do not believe for an instant that that exhausts the realm. It's like there, there are ways of interpreting these stories that work in the conceptual universe we inhabit right now. But there's a lot of things that we don't understand. And what I'm, the thing I've found about digging into these stories is that the deeper you dig, the more you find. And that's pretty damn, that's one of the things that convinced me that there was more to them than I had originally suspected because things would click and I'd think, wow, that's, real. that's really something. And then I would take it apart further and I'd think, oh, well, I thought that was something, but this is, this is even more remarkable. It just keeps opening and opening. And so I'm going to make it rational. I'm going to try to provide an answer to, and it is, I think you're right about speaking about Nietzsche and his capacity for prophecy and Dostoevsky's in the same category. It's like... There are prophetic elements to the Old and New Testament that seem to stretch over much vaster spans of time. And I'm going to try to produce a rational account of that. But I mean, one of the reasons that I think the New Testament is psychologically true, let's say, is because, and this is one of the things that's, that's, that's deeply embedded in the structure of the Bible. In, in the Old Testament, there's this idea, and, and I'm skipping ahead, that through a succession of states, the people who behave properly will eventually establish the proper state. And so the state is viewed in some sense as the, as the entity of salvation. But what happens in the New Testament is that idea gets, you could say, deconstructed. And instead of a state being the place of redemption, a state of being becomes the state of redemption. And so 
the idea that human beings will re be redeemed moves from the utopian state vision to the responsibility of the individual. And I think that's correct. I mean, I, I believe that that's the right answer. And I think that the West, in particular, is predicated on that idea, that idea because it makes the state subservient to the individual. I mean, there's a, there's a what? A dialogue, a continual dialogue. But in the final analysis, the locus of the divine is the individual, not the state. And I believe that that's so true that if we don't act it out and believe it, then we all die painfully. And that's true enough for me. So, thank you. Yeah. I thank you for illuminating talk. I'm going to keep you on, on the creation story, and if you don't mind, uh, because we know this editing that was done, there was a purpose for the editing. Can you give us your thoughts about the difference in the story of creation, especially pertaining to men, from the first chapter, which is very godlike, you know, by a word, and to the second one, which is more like a fatherly type of um, creation? Is it the selling point? What was the reason for this? type of editing to put the two together, one after the Well, I, I think, you know, the more cynical, would you call critic, criticisms of the Bible and, and the religious tradition, criticisms like Marx's or Freud's even, for that matter, make the case that it's a, pow it's a manifestation of power in politics, and, and that there's always a political or economic motivation behind the construction of the stories, and I think that that's true to some degree, but I don't think that it's true enough so that you can take that particular interpretive tack and be done with it. And I would say that to the degree that there are political and economic motivations that have shaped the stories, the fact that multiple stories have come together, they're sort of corrective in some sense. And so even at, if at the level of detail, there's political intrigue and, and politics, say, with regards to the ascendancy of Israel, when you step away from it, it becomes something that's more universal and escapes from that. And how that happened, uh, I don't know. I mean, I think it's safe to say, it's reasonably safe to say that the people who put this document together, they did two things. I think they were guided by their aesthetic taste and their conscience. I truly believe that. And the reason I believe that is because I think anything that was propagandistic would have been forgotten. Because you can't remember propaganda. No one likes it. It's like it's dead 10 years after you write it, or 20 years. And it isn't only that these books were assembled and written, it was that they were preserved and remembered. And to me, that means they have an affinity with the structure of memory. I mean, you think about it. How does a story last 10,000 years unless it's the kind of story you can remember? It doesn't. Because you forget all the forgettable stuff, and all you remember is the memorable stuff. And so there's this, there's this interplay between the document itself and its audience that shapes the document. And so, now I don't know how specifically I answered your question. Um, we're going to hit the different stories as they come up in sequence, and I think I'll shed some more light on the relationship between them <clears throat> doing that. Right, so um, I've been really interested in a lot of the stuff that you've been saying about dreams, because I've been lucid dreaming a lot for many years, but always in a sort of atheistic way as a sort of like a game or something like that. But um, because of seeing your talks and everything, I've started to think of it from a different perspective. Like you're now interfacing with something beyond the narrow scope of your conscious awareness that, or, or something like that, maybe mythological or maybe something like God. And so what I've been thinking about and what I maybe wondered what you'd think about it is that in some ways, when you're lucid dreaming, you're kind of you're getting beyond lim the limitations of an ordinary dream. You're sort of transcending limitations, which maybe is like it's not the purpose of people, right? Is it, it, because as a person, you're supposed to be limited in some way, as opposed to like God, who's like not limited. And how, but on the other hand, it's a good opportunity to kind of have control over your interactions with this like very special and like interesting thing. So, I guess the conundrum is that on one hand, like you can. You can control your interactions, but on the other hand, like you are controlling them. So I guess I'm wondering what do you think about that, and also just in general, what do you think about lucid dreaming as a thing? Like, should you do it? Or I had a client who could really lucid dream, you know? And one of the things, she used them now and then to solve problems, even though she didn't always pay attention to the answer. Sometimes she did. She, one of her, in one of her dreams, 
One of the characters told her that she would have to learn to live in a slaughterhouse. She was very afraid of life. And one of the consequences of that was that we went and watched an embalming. So, so the dreams were, but one of the things she did, she'd ask the characters what they were up to. You know, she, she was, instead of controlling, she would inquire. And so, but I don't know what to say about lucid dreaming beyond that. Like, I know it's a well-documented phenomena, and many people can do it, and women seem to be able to do it better than men. That's what the research indicates. But I think that what we don't know about lucid dreaming could fill a lot of books. So, I think you do. There is some danger in controlling it, I think, because you lose the spontaneous revelation, although not completely, because you can't control it completely. But I, like... You see, you might be interested in reading Jung's works on active imagination because he kind of learned to dream when he was awake and he spent a lot of time in the world of imagination when he was awake. The Red Books, for example. The Red Book is a, is a document of his experiences with awake dreaming. But he was very interactive with the dream, you know, instead of trying to bend it to his whim or his will. He was, he was exploring it it's in some sense like you'd explore a video game, right. you know, which are forms of dreams in and of themselves. So, yeah, I would say do it with an exploratory purpose in mind. And you could always ask yourself what you could learn, too, which is a very dangerous question to ask a dream. Because sometimes you'll find out what you have to learn. That's not so pleasant, but it's really worthwhile. Okay, yeah. In the beginning of your lecture, you talked about how society needed this kind of dreamlike religious base so we don't go between left and right violently and we can kind of have this base. And then you also said you admired Nietzsche for kind of uh, chopping down these, these ideological and kind of dogmatic weeds coming up from the base of Christianity. Um, I was wondering how, what your thoughts are on how society can have this kind of religious base without having these kind of dangerous ideologies that can spring up once in a while. That's what I'm trying to figure out. No, really. I mean, that really, that's the serious answer to that question. You know, I mean, the reason that I'm an admirer of Nietzsche is because like, he was the spirit of his times. So that's a good way of thinking about it. It's not like Nietzsche killed God. It's that Nietzsche gathered what was in the air and articulated it, right, incredibly profoundly. And so he put his finger on the spot. And in, that, in doing so, he announced the problem. And once you announce the problem, then maybe you can come up with a solution because you can't solve a problem unless you know what it is. And the fact that he made it so stark and so clear is horrifying in some sense, but at least we know where we stand. And so since then, and I would say particularly with, in many ways, particularly with the work of Jung and, and everything that's come out of that, which is a deeper study of mythology and its meanings, you know, we've been trying to address that the issue that Nietzsche brought up and trying to solve the problem. And the problem is something like the reunification of the spirit of mankind. It's something like that. Well, we're slogging through it, man. And that's, that's, that's why you're all here, at least in part. So we'll see how far we can get. I mean, by at this rate, we'll get to like the 12th verse in the first. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the aim, you know? Okay. I think it's because, it's, it's because of the, the gap between what we articulate and what we don't know. Something has to fill that gap. Like, I think the law could, be, could, could replace it if the law was total, but it isn't. It, it's, it's, it's bounded and, and incorrect, and there's something, it rests, it has to rest on something inside that's like this mediator between what we articulate and what we don't understand. It's something like custom, it's something like expectation. It's something like the intrinsic sense of justice, you know, that the law itself is aiming at. And those aren't fully articulated, but without them, there'd be no grounding. Like, without the body, the law would be a dictionary. You know, and if you don't know what a word means, using the dictionary is helpful, but not that helpful. Because, like, unless you've had the experience of anger, the dictionary can't tell you what anger means. It just refers to other words. But the words themselves refer to something else. And the law refers to something else. And without that, it has to be in tune with that something else and has to be in accordance with it. And so I, I don't think we can ever delineate the 
proper body of laws, and that's also why you like ideological utopias. See, the ideological utopias dispense with the transcendent. They say, this is what we need to do. It's like, no, you don't know. That's not good. You have to leave space for what you kind of know and for what you don't know. And, I mean, you know, in the story of the Tower of Babel, human beings make this massive building that's supposed to reach up to the heavens so that it'll take the place of God. Well, that's, that's the earliest warning we have of the danger of making things so big that you confuse them with God. And God gets irritated and comes down and makes everybody speak different languages and scatters them. It's like, well, that's what happens when you try to make something a totality, is that it starts to fragment inside and, and disintegrates into catastrophe. And so it's, it's almost as if we have to maintain this articulated space inside the dream, inside the custom, something like that, because otherwise it doesn't work. And I think that's the same as having respect for the fact that we have bodies. You know, we're not just abstract creatures that follow rules. We're not that at all. We only follow certain rules. We won't follow the other ones. And our societies will crumble. And so, and we, we just don't know enough to articulate the entire landscape of behavior with articulated rules. Not at all. We can't do it. It's beyond us. My question is also about dreams. Uh, you spoke about dreams as uh, like a representation of truths and universal truths that uh, can be interpreted into like myths and, and religion. And uh, as, as you say, it, it's very beneficial for the individual. And it sounds like also for, for the society as well because not everyone can as easily... Um, um, uh, re remember their dreams or, or interpret their, their dreams like that, and also it's it's um, like broadcasted to to all of society for their benefit. So, I guess I'm I'm wondering what the the evolutionary uh, advantage of dreams are, and I, uh, my question would be, do you think that dreams um, uh, suggest some sort of uh, evolutionary group selection, such as like groups that don't have these dreams that are represented into myths and religion, do you think they, they didn't survive as well? Okay, so I'm not going to answer the second part of that question because I'd have to go far too far off at a tangent for me to manage right now, but I can answer the first part. I mean, what happens when you're dreaming, there's a little switch, so to speak, in your brain that shuts off when you're dreaming and it stops you from moving, right? It shuts everything off except your eyes because who, you know, if you're moving your eyes back and forth, you're not going to get run around and get eaten by a lion, it's okay to move your eyes. But the rest of you is staying exactly where it is. Then you can run these simulations. And so what's happening at night, and this is a fairly well accepted theory of dreaming. We know that dreams update memories and help consolidate memories. They also help you forget. But what seems to be happening at night is that you're, you're running the underlying architecture of your cognitive ability in different simulations. And it's cost free because you're you're paralyzed. You're not running around there out in the world investigating. So it's part of the manner in which your brain experiments with the way the world can be represented. And so, and, and it seems absolutely necessary. And I mean, if you deprive people of REM sleep, they, they don't stay sane very long. There's something necessary about the dreaming process to maintenance of, the, of, of, of articulated sanity. So... You're doing some kind of organization at night when you descend into that chaos. And partly what seems to happen is that your categorical, you know, your categories have boundaries, right? But sometimes you don't have the categories correct. And so the boundaries have to loosen and other things need to be put in the categories or some things shunted away. And in the dream, the category structure loosens, which is why dreams are so peculiar. But they're experimenting. It's your mind is experimenting with the underlying categorical structure of imagination and trying to update your, your mode of being in the world. Dreams often concentrate on things that provoke anxiety. So if you wake people up when they're dreaming, the most commonly reported emotion is anxiety. And so the dream is like the first stages of the attempt to contend with the unknown. And so the dream is half unknown and half known, which is also why it's so peculiar, you know, because you kind of understand it, but you don't really. And it, it, it partakes of the unknown and of the known. And it's the bridge between the two, something like that. So 
Um, okay, so my question is kind of two parts. The first one is just like a general question and then just the application of the question. So my first question is, do you think that consciousness and beinghood are inextric inextricably linked? And then secondly, so if there was something like a, a supercomputer that one could house theoretically a perfect brain of a person in it, does that thing then become the same person as the person who was before? So is there a transcendency to beinghood but not to conscience? Okay, so the first question is, well, I would say that the kind of being that these stories are concerned with yeah. is absolutely dependent on consciousness. Now, whether or not that means that being as such is dependent on consciousness actually depends on how you define being. Right, so it's always tricky when you ask, an, if is a, an, an, an example of B? Those are tricky questions because it depends on how you define the two. But for our purposes, the being that we're discussing that's represented in these stories is intrinsically associated with conscious experience. And consciousness is given this constitutive role. It says that the experience that we're talking about would not exist if consciousness did not exist. So you can think about it as a kind of game in a way, and then you have to decide for yourself whether that's a game that can be generalized. And I won't answer the second part, okay? If you don't mind. All right. And the main question is, <clears throat> one of the main reasons why I'm interested in so much of your work, and I think many people other are as well, is that you kind of leave literalism at the door and you open up another door to a much more deeper meaning. In your interview with Transliminal Media, you mentioned Liz Eibel's book, uh, The Serpent, uh, the, the, the Tree, The Serpent, yeah, yeah. And, and Vision. And you note that we as a species are very good at recognizing camouflage patterns of snakes, particularly in the lower field of vision. And you further note that visual acuity is, is correlated with that um, and that it co-evolved. And you summarize thusly by saying the following, and I'm paraphrasing you, you say, what gives you vision? Snakes do. That's what it says in Genesis. What else gives you vision? Fruit. That's also right. That's why we have color vision. What makes you self-conscious if you're a man? Woman. That's Eve. And so I understand at the elementary level some of the concepts that you have about representations, dreams, abstractions, etc. But kind of raises the question for me, you know, I'm not accusing you of any creationism or literalism. Yeah. You know, what's your point? Why did you make that connection? What's the meaning of the story of Genesis vis-a-vis -vis Liz Eibel's book? No you know? problem. We're going to, as soon as I get past this first <clears throat> Genesis 1, we're going we're gonna to hit that hard. So, so... Well, uh, partly, yes, I'm suggesting that it foreshadowed it. And, and I think they're the same thing. I mean, Isabel in her books plays with that idea metaphorically, but she never really takes it seriously, which is no problem. I mean, there's only so much you can take seriously, and she did a fine job of what she did. But I'll talk about that a lot, because it's a very complicated issue. I mean, I would say to begin with that the, that the systems that you use to deal with radical uncertainty are the same systems that your primate ancestors evolved to deal with snakes. That's a good start. So, okay? Okay, one more and then we're done. I'm an aerospace science engineer and an expert computer programmer and I have three rapid fire questions so I'm going to get through them quick. Based on your opinion of where the universities now stand in terms of humanities and social sciences, <clears throat> is mathematics more powerful than articulated speech? I'm not sure, I'm not exactly sure how Does the first... Does it take you more powerful to study mathematics and hard science in universities? Oh. Well, it depends on what you mean by power, I guess. I mean, obviously, studying mathematics and computer science makes you insanely powerful. The question is, to what end? And I don't think that you can extract an answer to that from the study of mathematics. The humanities are there to ground people in proper citizenhood. That's, that's a way of thinking about it. And so, yes, it makes you powerful. But then the question is, who has the power? Because it might not be you. It might be the mathematics, so to speak. You know, because you never know what you're an agent of, precisely. And so, yeah, well, look, I've got nothing against computer programmers. I mean, more power to you guys and mathematicians as well. But yes, and it has to be a tool. Right, it has to be a tool of something. And what the humanities were for to was to tell people what the tools should be used for. And so it, the tools themselves are crazily powerful. But that's, that's not necessarily, you know, an, an untrammeled good. So, I have to stop because. One more about art. Okay, quick. You love art. I know you love okay. art. Okay. I want to answer this question. All okay. Right. Okay, you were in this, I guess, one room in a museum in New York where yeah. you'd seen some original Renaissance artwork masterpieces. Yeah. Like these are generally accepted as amazing artifacts, okay? <clears throat> Does a, an original work of art 
as opposed to a high fidelity reproduction contain the spirit of the artist who created it and does this account for the disparity in how much you'd have to pay for an original? It does in part. I knew a good portrait artist, eh? And uh, one of the things he pointed out about a great portrait is that it actually contains time. So, you know, because a photograph is one instant. But a portrait is you layered on you, layered on you. La so it's got a thickness, you know, and I think you can see that thickness in the original, but it's also a direct manifestation of that creative act of perception. And I don't think you get that. You just can't get the fidelity of the original with the reproduction. But there's more to it than that, too, because the painting doesn't end with the frame. You know, like we tend to think of the painting itself as the object, but, but most objects are are densely innervated with, his, with historical context. And you can say, well, the historical context isn't the object, but it depends on what you mean by the object. And often people, when they buy a piece of a painting, are buying the historical context. And you just don't get that with the reproduction. It's a kind of magic. It's like, do you want to have Elvis Presley's guitar or another guitar just like it? Well, you want to have Elvis's guitar. It's why. You can't tell it's Elvis's guitar by looking at it. That's how it looks to me. Okay, we gotta go.